Thanks, guys. Um, so my talk is directly related to the previous talk, but like Jennifer said, a little bit of a different point of view. So um, to introduce myself, uh, my name is Sasha. I live in Chicago. I was born in Ukraine. I grew up in Israel, and then I moved to Chicago because I missed the winter so much. <laughs> um, uh, I work at Tenth Magnitude as a Chicago-based cloud consulting company. We do cloud consulting. We work mainly with Microsoft Azure. We help people uh, develop uh, CI CD pipelines, and we also automate infrastructure with Chef. So lots of things. Um, I'm a co-organizer of the Azure Meetup, and I'm also a co-organizer of DevOps Day Chicago, which is completely amazing, and you should all come and check it out next year. Um, and I also, I started my journey as a .NET developer, so I also arrived at a DevOps uh, kind of in a different way than most of the people in the room, I assume. So this is about me, and I'm gonna be talking about a single point of failure, right? So before we dive into this, uh, let's define things clearly. So what is a single point of failure? Single point of failure is any part of your system that if it fails, the entire system is down, right? And generally speaking, this is obviously undesirable in any production system. And the definition of a single point of failure comes hand in hand with the definition of high availability. High availability is defined as A, you need to have redundancy of, by not having any kind of single point of failure in your system. So everything in the system should be backed up and be able to fail over. But this is not all, right? You, you also need to have a reliable crossover. So right, if, if you have a backup um, of your database server, it doesn't really help you if you can't reliably fail over to it. And this is usually not such a simple process, so you have to be able to test and verify that you can actually do this. And there is a third part to this, and this is detection of failure. And detection of failure is also a complicated thing, and you need to be able to identify that your system fails, not the entire system, obviously, but some part of it, and initiate the failover to the backup component, right? So this is all great, and it's not all, only great, but it is very, very complicated. It's very complicated and it's very expensive actually to build highly available systems. That's why most people don't do it. And if you poke in most systems, even those which are running in production, even those that cost a lot of money, um, you will find easily that they have single points of failure all over the place. But let's just say that all of our infrastructure and all of our software is perfect. Right, so there's no single points of failure, everything is backed up, every da database in the, is in the cluster, every server is load balanced, this is just a work of our architecture, and then, whoops, something happened. So now my entire system is on fire, and all of our phones are ringing, and Twitter hates me, and people are saying that they will never use my product again, oh my god, what's happening, right? And I'm not exaggerating, right? You can easily name a bunch of multi-million dollar businesses that went down for like 24 hours for something very simple like an expired SSL certificate, right? So we probably just forgot a dependency. So in addition to all of our servers, um, meet Bob. Bob is an awesome person. He's a magician. And he knows everything. He manages everything. And whenever there is a problem, everybody comes to Bob. And Bob just happened to go on vacation. Whoops. So here's the thing now. Imagine buying a server that has an uptime of like roughly 16 hours a day, <laughs> right? Has interruptions in that uptime. Like it, it's not a consecutive 16 hours. Um, it, it's a single one of its kind, it's the only one in the world, and you can't replicate it. Awful, right? It, like, you would never, ever sign that check, like, as an administrator, never, right? So the truth is that humans are just not highly available. This happens to be, right? So, well, first of all, how did we get here, right? And there are multiple reasons, and Jonathan talked about some of them. 
So there could be lack of budgets, right? I, I just can't afford to hire more people. It could be lack of people, because I couldn't find anyone qualified to do the same job. Or I, I think, in most cases, it's just human nature. People like to know their system, they like to be in control of it, and they just kind of naturally roll into being that expert person. And I'm actually really surprised that not many people raise their hands when, when um, asked if they have ever been a single point of failure, because I can promise you many of you have been. Um, so how do you recognize that you have a problem? Well, let's start with one. Jonathan mentioned that too. It's the keys to the kingdom problem. I like this one. So, whoa. This happens a lot, right? You have a single person who is an administrator on a production server or servers or whatever part of the system that he has the sole access to. I, I was working with a client a few months ago and uh, while I was working there, they had a 10 hour long production deployment, which they, by the way, told me was not a problem because they only did it like every once in six months, so, you know, not too bad. Um, so anyway, while they were like doing the 10 hour long production deployment with their entire team, they spent 45 minutes working, waiting for someone to finish the drive home because he was the only person who can go log in into production server and enable something that they needed enabled. Well, um, you may say that I automated my entire system and this is all great and my whole system is deployed with Chef or Puppet and it's all triggered by Jenkins and it's great, no humans involved. Well, that doesn't completely solve your problem because someone's managing Jenkins, right? I mean, people are managing systems, systems still are not managing themselves. So someone is managing the SMTP servers and someone's managing the VPN, someone's an administrator. And so <clears throat> this problem is actually, well, wait, um, I forgot something. So how do we get there? Um, Jonathan was talking about like this situation evolving organically. So I don't know, I, we used to be a, an organization of five people and we started developing the application and I was the only person managing the Jenkins and then the team grew. Uh, no one thought about adding more people to you know, Jen managing Jenkins, so that's all fine, right? Um, but in some cases it's also like someone is just taking over. So I've seen that happen too, right? I've seen people write really long emails about how no one else should ever touch production or create Git repositories, or delete Jira projects, or whatever it is, right? Because these people usually mean well, but they are creating a real problem. And so if you're the person whose eye starts twitching when you think about someone else touching your production, please come talk to me. We can start an open space talk about it. So um, this problem is easily solved, actually, because um, a, everybody understands this, that this is a problem, and B, it doesn't cost any extra money to solve it. So <laughs> it's solved by role-based access. So first of all, don't give an access to production to Bob. <laughs> give an access to production to production administrators. Okay, and then make sure that there's more than one person in the production administrators group, because otherwise it's irrelevant. And um, you can also create backdoors. Uh, don't use them unless you really have an emergency because you want to be able to keep track of who's doing what to your production. But you can actually create a service account. So if your entire DevOps team goes on a strike because you didn't buy enough donuts one day, um, you can actually use a backdoor. Um, then there's another thing. So that's a true story uh, told by a friend of mine recently. So she used to work uh, for a company, and she was on call for that company, and she didn't have any access to production, including not being able to like, look at production logs. So when she got paged at 3 o'clock in the morning, she had to call her direct manager, okay, who had to sign off on her having temporary access to production logs. Then they had to call sysadmin group, who could actually go and enable that access, grant her that access to production logs. So roughly like two hours after the problem started, she could actually start investigating what's happening. So if someone is on call, please make sure that they have all the necessary access they, have, they need to solve the problem. And 
I can't really overemphasize this, but trust your people. <laughs> Because your people are professional, and they're motivated, and they're smart, okay? Because you wouldn't have hired them if they weren't. And if they're professional and motivated and smart, then you should be able to trust them to make good decisions. So again, whoever is on call should be able to access everything they need to solve the problem. Okay, problem number two. And I call it beware of the expert, or this will take me 15 minutes to fix and eight hours to explain. Okay, raise your hand if you've heard this before. Great, raise your hand if you've said it before. Yeah, so this is aggravated by the fact that not only do I want to go in and solve it in 15 minutes instead of waiting for someone else to do it in a day, it's also, it's kind of hard to justify spending a day on something that could be solved in 15 minutes, right? But the problem is, this is a really big deal. Because this right here means that some part of your system is not documented, not automated, and the only process you have to fix the issue is in your hand. So if your boss tells you that you can't afford to spend a day on explaining to someone how to do this, then you should ask them if they can afford fixing this problem in three or four days if you're gone, right? So like, if, if it takes a day to explain it, it will probably take like three days to investigate what the hell is happening and try to fix it if the, problem, if the person who has the knowledge is not actually there. So the best way I know to solve this problem is delegating to juniors because juniors are like wonderful people. They ask really hard questions. And when I say juniors, I don't mean like someone who's right out of college and new, although these are especially wonderful, but it's also someone who like just arrived on the team and hasn't, like isn't familiar with your process, he doesn't know how it's always been before now, and he's just not like emotionally involved with your code base. Because you are emotionally involved with your code base. So, so when someone is like, why is this a real bad hack right here? You go like, well, you weren't here, right? We were like over budget, under pressure, we had to deliver, and that open source tool you're so excited about, it wasn't even in existence. Well, now it is, so if someone doesn't ask a question, you might not, not use it, but if you do use it, you might improve your actual system and be better off. So, um, the result of solving this problem should be documentation. And it can come in many ways. It can come in the form of actual documents. And then it can come in form of comments in your code that actually explain what's happening. The, one of the best ways is tests and automation because tests and automation are actually documentation that they document your desired system state. And they actually verify that this is the desired system state. And then it can come in form of features, right? Because say, if the manual process is me like copying images to some sort of file share on some sort of server, then maybe I should just build a feature, a software feature that will allow me to do this automatically. Okay, problem number three, and that is again something that Jonathan mentioned, and this is called, I can't afford to take vacation. So in this case, like, you can see it happening. Um, people just kind of volunteer themselves to try to achieve the impossible, right? They, they try to be that person who can always be there. They work like super long weeks. They never take vacation. If they're out of office on like one day, problems start happening. So, well, maybe it gives them job security. First of all, it's really terrible job security. And second of all, maybe you want to be promoted or something, and you will never get promoted because no one can deal without you, right? Um, it's also like people think that this actually improves productivity. So like, wow, this person's working really long hours, so he must be good for business. Well, no. So this is a graph of hours uh, versus productivity. So this is weekly hours. It starts at 24, ends at 72. Right, and so the dotted line in there is average product for a week, and the uh, solid line is marginal product for a week. So you can see that the productivity increases from 24 to like 50 hours, and then it just actually starts falling down. 
right? So this person who worked like extra 22 hours not only didn't produce extra product, they actually made it worse. They're, they were actually producing less product than if they were working less. This graph actually comes from a factory on which people were actually creating physical goods, which sounds like counterintuitive, but this is really true. And it's even harder to measure uh, when you talk about intellectual product, but I can promise you that every research that I've le ever looked on that was done in the subject proves that um, working longer hours does not increase productivity. So don't encourage yourself to work longer hours and do not encourage your people to work longer hours. And if your boss is incentivizing or pressuring you in any way to work longer hours, show them that graph or every other graph you can find within 20 seconds of searching online. Um, it, this is as simple as that, right? You need to rest to be at your best because um, when you're tired, you're slow and you're sloppy and you're procrastinating and you're making bad decisions and this is not good for anybody. Um, I personally think that cell phones are probably the single worst thing that happened to people and businesses in the last century, right? Because if cell phones didn't happen, and if people were actually unreachable when they left the office, we would find a way to solve this problem in a better way. But instead, we'd just keep expecting people to do the impossible, right? So <clears throat> if you think that you can't take vacation, then I can tell you that there are, in, there are companies um, in the US that make people take mandatory vacations. Usually it's financial institutions. Usually they make people go away for two weeks and actually lose all contact with the office completely. They do it because they want to prevent money embezzlement, right? Because if you have to delegate the control over all of your files and explain to people everything you need to be able to be productive at your job, then the chances that you can embezzle from the company are far less. But this also proves that this is always possible, right? You can always turn your phone off and go away, and the company should be able to continue to function. Um, and another thing, if you're scared of making your people go completely away and turn off their phone, and you're like, oh my god, I'm freaking out, I don't know how to do this, um, there's a concept of game days. Game days usually means that you're breaking infrastructure in production in a controlled manner. The reason you do it in production is because production is the closest approximation of production you will ever get. Um, and you do it in controlled manner, so like things do go wrong, right? If you like try to break your cache and fail over to the secondary cache, like yes, things might go wrong, but then it happened on a Monday morning when you have the lowest traffic because you tracked it down and, and your entire team is in and you know you can actually fix it. Right, instead of it being like Friday night on the Black Friday or something. Um, so the way it relates to the current topic is you can do the same to the person who you suspect as a single point of failure. Just make them go like intern with another team for a week. And while they're away, just like make your best effort to not talk to them and just deal with the problems you have yourself or like with the rest of your team. And then you do have the backup if, if something really goes wrong, right? Um, and like document everything you do and, and lessons and learn the lessons. So like whatever you do, really try to not be the single point of failure and not let, any, let anyone else be the single point of failure. And um, I had to like add this slide yesterday. So the thing is I have noticed a line to the ladies room a few times. And I just have to say a great job, Dose Silicon Valley, for <laughs> this happening because that actually made me really excited. So <laughs> thanks so much and um, enjoy.